Now, I met you uh, last week and we talked about worship, why worship works. I gave you three points, if you can remember that. Uh, let me just uh, go through them again with you, uh, if we could. Uh, number one, we were made to worship God. Uh, number two, um, worship is a magnet to human beings. Worship is a magnet to human beings. Number three, we said that um, worship draws the presence of God. Now I would like to speak to you about the fourth point and then the fifth point and we'll end with the sixth point. Point number four is simply this. Worship is most important because worship is the only thing that continues from earth into eternity. Now, I'm going to read to you Revelations, and I thought I'll just give you a few verses, but you know, when I read Revelations, I thought to myself, wow, Revelations is actually, uh, at least Revelations 4, is a very, very short chapter, and it's very, very powerful. So I want to read the whole chapter to you. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. So immediately I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven and one set on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and in the back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes all around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. What were they doing? Worshipping God. That's all. Worshipping God. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord. You are worthy to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things. Hey, you created all things for what? For worship. God, you created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. Do you see any evangelism? <laughs> Do you see any feeding of the poor? All good things. Do you see any ministry of signs and wonders and healings and miracles? Do you see any of that? Do you see any normal church service going on, communion service, nothing. Nothing. Nothing else but worship. Worship is important. Worship is first. Worship works because God loves worship and it continues from earth into eternity. Praise God. Praise God. How important worship is. If we would take that to heart, we will know that Earth is probably just practice for heaven. I want us all to learn to go deeper into worship because worship continues. Now, number five, God moves in worship. God himself moves in worship, quite literally. The power of God is released in and through worship. Do you believe it? Acts 16 25 to 34. At midnight, once again, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, 
and the prisoners were listening to them. Again, if you didn't see me doing this last week, there's always time to worship. Even in the darkest dungeon, in the dirtiest, most horrible of places, you know, where there is hopelessness, yet there was hope in Saul, in Paul, I should say, and Silas. There was hope. The Bible says, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And that hope in Paul and Silas caused them to worship even in prison, where they were in chains and there was no, no one to defend them, no one but God. And it was time to worship. And so they began to sing and to pray and the prisoners heard them. And let's read on. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He thought he lost all hope. He was scared for his life. He said to himself, I should take my life. But then there was a voice from the prison. Can you imagine? <laughs> I look at it, you know, sometimes people are waiting for a voice to come outside of prison saying, you're free, you know, uh, you've been pardoned, you know, uh, okay, just, only, just three more days and you'll be released, you know. We're all waiting for the voice to come outside of the prison to give us hope. But hope this time came from inside the prison. Can you imagine that? When we are in Christ, when we are in God, when there is hope, when there is strength, when there is joy that comes from the presence of the Lord. And you know God's presence knows no bounds. And here we hear Paul called with a loud voice. From where? From inside the prison. Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, jailer. Do yourself no harm, for we are all still here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You see, friends, it all started just with worship. Can you imagine some of us, you know, we go for evangelism classes, we go, you know, to be taught how to reach our friends. We go and we learn, you know, four spiritual laws and all this, really, don't get me wrong, they are good. But this jailer was saved that day because it all began with worship. It all began with worship. And then power fell from heaven. God came into that prison. That's why the prison couldn't take it, right? God's presence. The earthquake happened because when God's presence comes, man, you know, look out. <laughs> prison doors opened, chains fell. And the jailer asked the question, was there any evangelism strategy going on there? Not really. Will people ask you the question, please tell me, tell me X church what must I do to be saved? And it all flowed out of worship. And because worship draws God's presence, He came, God moved. God moved in a powerful way. And that power opened people's eyes. Saved the man from killing himself. Not just from killing himself, but saved his soul that very day. The greatest king was also the strongest worshipper. The greatest king, David. I think some of you are thinking Solomon. <laughs> no, I'm talking about the greatest king. In the eyes of God, the greatest king that ever lived. The king in which and to which the scripture says in Acts 15, God wants to rebuild his tabernacle, David. David, the greatest king was also, come on now, you know it, the strongest worshipper. You see, when nobody was looking, he was writing Psalms long before he became king. Just him and those, those few sheep, he was with his harp, and he was worshipping the Lord. God chose a worshipper that day 
when his prophet came, Samuel, and looked at the first son, looked at the second son, looked at all seven sons, he was so impressed with the first son, he said, surely this is the Lord's chosen. And God says, no, I have not chosen him. And they said, Samuel said, we will not sit down until your eighth and last son comes. You know, David was really forgotten that day. He was out there with the sheep, worshipping the Lord. But God found himself a worshipper, a man after his own heart. Authority goes hand in hand with adoration. I believe that King David was given authority because he had adoration. I want to say again, authority does go hand in hand with adoration. I want to say this to you, Matthew 28, 16 to 18, we read this. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. They worshipped, but some doubted. So all of them worshipped, but few of them doubted, even while they were worshipping. And Jesus came, listen very carefully now, and spoke to them, to all of them, even those who doubted. He spoke to them after they worshipped him. He spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. They came, they adored him, they worshipped him, some doubted, and he spoke to all of them, including those who doubted, all authority. They came, worshipped, adored him, authority. Worship, authority. Are you all with me? I'm saying that authority goes hand in hand with adoration. One more. 1 Samuel 13, 14. 1 Samuel 13, 14 says, The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. You want to hear the next one? Same verse now. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. What's that? Worship. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. Worship. And what follows after? And the Lord commanded him to be commander over his people. Did you hear that? Worship and power. Worship and authority. Adoration and authority. Authority goes hand in hand with adoration. 1 Thessalonians 2.4 But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Not as pleasing men. We don't want to be men pleasers. We want to be God pleasers. We want to be God pleasers. First Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.4 But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Here another one. Acts 5.29 But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, you remember this? You know, it was the leaders in Jerusalem, you know, coming down hard on the apostles, telling them, why are you preaching in this name? And we warn you not to preach in this name. And what did Peter and the other apostles answer? They answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. We are here to please God. We are here to go after his own heart. What do you really want, God? Not just what we decide to give, what we decide we want to do. No. We want to really worship you. We want to really please you. 2 Corinthians 5.9 says, Therefore, we make it our aim. We make it our aim, our purpose. Whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. To Him. Not to anyone else, to Him. And of course, Acts 15, 16 to 17. I read this last week. I'll read it again. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Oh, God misses David. He does. You know, you think about David. Why would it be surprising that God misses the David? 
the spirit of David, the heart of David. David after God's own heart. How many of us are living like that? I pray that many more will. From today onwards, many of us will be chasing after God's own heart. Amen. God misses David. God wants to rebuild, not the tabernacle of Abraham, although that's powerful, the tabernacle of Moses, that's powerful. Even the temple of Solomon, you know, no other beauty like the temple of Solomon as recorded in the Bible. But no, God doesn't want all that. Beautiful and amazing as they may be, God misses David. He says, I will come back. I myself will rebuild the tabernacle of David. And you think it's just only a physical tabernacle? It could be. But God has not always been for physical things. In, 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 in fact, the Bible does say to us, you know, what can you build me? <laughs> I'm God. You know, the earth is my footstool. So God is not really interested in physical bu- buildings, but He's interested in our hearts, in our spirit. So when he, I, I believe when He says He wants to return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, I believe He misses David and He wants more Davids, more people who will worship Him. Praise the Lord. God will seek for Himself again. Men and women who will be after His own heart and the tabernacle of David, it shall be rebuilt. This is worship. This is the kind of worship God is seeking for. You know, it doesn't always say that God is seeking. He asks us to seek Him. But I think there's only one or two occasions in the Bible that speaks about God seeking. You know, one I can remember is um, Jesus says, I came to seek and save the lost. You know, another one uh, that speaks about how, you know, uh, the shepherd goes out to seek the one that was lost and the woman seeks that coin that was lost, and the father, you know, looks out for the son that was prodigal. And of course, the other one in John 4, when Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, he said, God is spirit, and he seeks for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. God is seeking for worshipers. And he will give us, he will bless us, he will pour out on us, He will, you know, bless us with the authority that we need to live a victorious life. Church, may the Lord just fill our hearts with a desire to worship God as He should be worshipped. May Acts Church be a worshipping church. May we fulfill our calling and the very reason why we were created. And may we experience the more of God, the so much more of God.